busy talking. I didn't hear you. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful, beautiful morning. Amen. And what a beautiful day to know the Lord. Yes. Um, I guess <laughs> they asked me if I wanted to open, and I guess I'll just share a little bit about, I mean, most everyone knows that we have suffered a fire, but... And God didn't cause the fire. I've no, I mean, I know, have no doubt about that. But God has been active and there every step of the way. Uh, countless things that I'll probably share, and some people will probably get sick of me sharing. But it just amazes me that the lengths he goes to and how he talks to all of us. He's no respecter of persons. So he's talking to everyone if we would just tune in and be aware how he's reaching out to us. Amen. So I have no doubt that's what you heard. <clears throat> um, just a couple things. Um, I pulled in behind the sheriff in the fire truck, and I had begun praying before I even got to my home because I just knew. And I was praying for God to give me grace and the words to, the right words to say and to shine his light in this whole situation and to be his example and that his glory would be revealed in all of this. And I just started praying in tongues because I couldn't help it, and I just continued to pray. And so the crowd that gathered, I'm sure they heard me because I was just pacing in my yard and praying, and, and um, I was praising God. And um, Dan was in the hospital still, and so... And then the puppies, I had to run to the emergency uh, vet. And when I come back and we were wrapping things up, it was like probably 11.30 at night. <clears throat> and as I was leaving, I was in my car and I had just turned on to the main road and I just started praying. I said, God, I need an encounter with you. I need you to talk to me like you're sitting in the seat beside me. And I looked over at my seat in the car and not that God doesn't do that. I know people having genuine encounters with God. But I think when those happen, it's like God has to, he's like coming down to our level. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, but it was almost as if, and I did hear it, but it was like someone had taken a needle and slid it across the record, you know, <laughs> you know, and then it was like, I became acutely aware of what I was praying, that I had to talk to him and I needed to hear from him and I needed to see him or whatever. And, and I just stopped and I said, God, I'm so sorry because I don't need you to come down to my level. Why do I need to see you? Why do I need to talk to you? I have you in me. What more do I need? Yes. You are with me. You never leave me. You never forsake me. Everywhere that I'm going to go through this next few weeks or whatever, he's with me. Yeah. And a peace just flooded my soul. And from then on, it was, it's been okay. It really is okay. Um, I got back to the VA. Has, uh, Dan was at the VA hospital. And when I got back there, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and they were so, so kind. And, and they brought me a recliner so I could sleep in the room with him because before they weren't allowing that. And then they showed me where the shower was so that I could clean up because I smelled of smoke. And in the shower at 1 o'clock in the morning at the VA, I just, I was singing. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. 
O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. That's all I could sing. I couldn't help it. I just kept singing. And then, like I said, it's been that way through the entire thing. There are multiple things, like I said, that I'd prob I'll probably share. Little things that, amongst all the burn, that weren't touched. You know, I mean, from the sign that's on Facebook, but there are hundreds of things that I found that were just little signs here and there that God's like, I, see, I'm right here. And one of them was, if you, if some of you remember, I think it's been like seven years ago, Mark McBride um, preached a message, and, and then he passed out those little wooden dowels to remind us as we carried them in our pockets or, or billfold or whatever, that a threefold cord is not easily broken. And in my digging through the rubble, I found my little, my little dowel. It was dirty, of course, from the ashes, and of course I'd been carrying it in my pocket and in my billfold for seven years, so it was a little worn and, and everything. But it was, again, God saying, you know, that reminded me of the threefold cord and that, in fact, he's with us every step of the way. We have nothing to fear, nothing to be upset about. I mean, the joy of the Lord really was, I mean, I could feel it. Yeah. <clears throat> sad at the loss of my puppy and, and, and our kitty cat and stuff, but yet there's still joy. And so as I, I had s several other little things that um, a ring and Dan's marbles that he lost in the apple tree. <laughs> he lost his marbles. Yeah. Just little things that are silly that, you know, meant something to us. And I had all these little things in my hand and I got to the hotel room and I said, you know, these these all made it through the fire. I don't want to leave them in here and have someone take them, you know, or anything. So I went to carry them out to my car and put them in my console. And when I put everything in, in my console, the dowel was missing. And I was so upset because I thought, are you kidding me? It made it through the fire and now I've lost it. And so I'm walking around where I parked and then through the parking lot trying to find this little wooden dowel. And for several days, every time I went to my car, because I'd park in different spots, I would look trying to find that little wooden dowel. Couldn't find it. And I would say, almost a week later, I po parked in a totally different spot. And that morning, Dan and I were going out to take care of business. And when I walked out, I'll start crying. Um, when I walked out, right by my car door on the ground was a little dowel. And I reached down and I grabbed it and I said, you know, oh, thank you, Lord. And when I looked at it, I don't know if you can see this, it's not dirty. And he said, oh, the rain must have washed it off. And I said, do you see this? It's brand new. And I heard the Lord say, I make all things new. And then, of course, I'm just crying because, you know, he doesn't have to do that. But he did that because he loves us. And he's doing things for us all the time. And... I heard him say, you know, I make all things new. So as I'm, I put it so I can see it while I'm driving and I'm laying there, it's laying there and I'm thinking to myself, you're so awesome, God. I got a new camper. I'm going to have a new home. I'm going to have new clothes. And he said, but it's not just for you. You're in this with your husband and it's for Dan too. And I looked over at him and I said, you know what? The Lord said, this is your dowel too, because you're in this too. He makes all things new, new kidneys, new lungs, yeah. a new knee, yeah. all things new. What part of all, I mean, you know, we've heard it said many times, what isn't included in all? Yeah. And so that's for all of us. You know, when we just need to be more aware of him and his presence every day because he's with us every step yeah. of the way. Yeah. He doesn't leave us. He's talking to us all the time. Is it always something physical? No. But he's still talking to us. There's no reason to fear. There's no reason to be afraid. We can walk in the peace and the joy. And because we are in the midst of all the chaos and the commotion, that's how his glory is shining. Because yeah. people are looking and wondering, how are they doing this? Well, we're not. He is. That's right. But anyway, so I just encourage everybody to tune in and listen to the rain. Or listen, you know, God's talking to us all the time. And... It says, you know, 
us being evil want to give good things to our children, but how much more he wants to do for us, he wants to do so, so many awesome things for us if we would just be aware of it. And it's not arrogant, and it's not selfish or bad for us to expect that he is. Yes. I get up every morning, I'm like, what are you going to do today, God? Because really, every day he's doing something phenomenal. And when we share those things to other people, they can be encouraged and know he's a good father and he wants to do great things for us. Amen. And that's how his glory is, you know, fills the earth. But anyway. I guess we don't have any announcements. So are there any prayer requests? Roberto? Sheila? Anyone else? And he makes all things new, all things new, guys. <laughs> so that's our bodies. That's everything. Amen. Our relationship with him. He restores that back to what he desired it to be. Yes. All things. James?
That's good. You know? Awesome. That's the kind of thing. They should look at them. Good. All right. Sheila? Let's stand and thank the Lord for all these requests. Lord, we love you this morning, and we're so grateful and thankful, God, that you have finished all of these needs, that it was done at the cross, God, that in you we live and move and have our being. God, that we praise you and worship you for your blessings, for all that you've done for each one of us. Each one of these needs, you have already been aware of and already provided the answer. We thank you for the testimonies, God, as you move in the rest of this service, God, that you talk to each heart and each mind, draw each one of us a little closer to you and restore the relationship that you died on the cross to complete. You are an awesome God, and we worship you and we magnify you, God. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God. And we can trust and rest in your peace and your rest love you, God, that you provide for every situation. You know the number of hairs on our head, God. Nothing is impossible for you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless him, Lord.
John, would you like to come do the offering? Please. <coughs> and John, if you want to say the prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you today, God, for your continuing outreach to us, Lord God, to draw us near and make us more like you and feel your love. Increase our Worship with us.
on the seas when his disciples were crying out. If we do this right, the church, many of the Muslims will, will be hearing the heart of the Lord if we do this right. Because even in the Middle East right now,
Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because he overcame you, our overcomers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Give the Lord a good hand this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we love you this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Thank you, Tammy, for opening. Thank you, Mike, and the worship team. Great job, as always. Hallelujah. Helping us to become more sensitive and aware of the presence of God. His spirit moving. Amen. Thank the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Sunday school kids, you can be dismissed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I thought when Mike was talking about the storm and this different things, and of course, the, the scripture, you know, says that, to paraphrase it, but uh, others have mentioned, has said this before, but you can only rest in the storm that you have authority over, or you only have authority over the storm you can rest in. And so, uh, you know, we, we're living in times that are perilous, and we know that, but uh, no need to get panicky or paranoid. Praise the Lord. God's still on the throne. We can relax and trust him to lead us and to guide us through every situation. Tammy's uh, testimony she was sharing this morning is a perfect example of that. And I thought I'd, I'd forgotten about, Sheila mentioned that young lady, and I, I don't remember now how long ago it was, but I remember having this dream. It was really an unusual dream. A lot of my dreams are unusual, but this one was particularly unusual because it didn't make any sense to me but it wouldn't go away. And I kept, it just kept rolling over and over in my mind to the point that I actually wrote it down because I thought there's got to be something to this even as crazy as it looks or sounds, it seems. So, I don't know, a day or two later, Sheila called me and told me this gal wanted to meet with me. Never heard of her, never met her before, didn't know anything about her, absolutely nothing about her. And Sheila didn't say anything other than she was having some real issues. And... Uh, so I told him I'd meet him a certain time, and I came down to the church, and I was here, and I was up here front praying, because I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to this woman. I, I don't know her. I don't know anything about her. I don't know how I'm supposed to help her. Uh, you know, I've interacted with people a lot of times, and you can't just go in there with a plan, because it doesn't usually work according to your plan. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because you can offend, and you can get all you know caught up in a debate rather than actually ministering so I try to restrain myself from you know going that direction but I didn't really didn't have a clue what I was supposed to say and I was up here praying and I heard the Lord clearly as I've ever heard him in my spirit and he said just read a dream and I thought oh yeah that ought, that ought to go well you know because I'm I know the dream see and I know it just doesn't make sense it's not like something coherent and rational it was just weird and so I kept praying, and just in case that wasn't the Lord, yeah. <laughs> and, and I never got another word from him, which is not unusual for the Lord, because usually he'll tell you, and if you want to argue about it, you just argue with yourself, because he's, he's already told you what he wants, you know. So they showed up, and we sat here. The, I was sitting in the front pew, and I think they were sitting in the second, and just we were just talking, and I just let her talk for a little while, and, and uh, the more she talked, the more uncomfortable I became, because I knew I got to tell her this dream, so... I said, let me, let me just do what I feel like the Lord wants me to do. So I just started telling her the dream. And I'm not going to go into all of it, but let me just give you a couple examples of how God can work. This is how God does speak to us all the time. And it isn't just so that we can say, wow, God spoke to me. I'm, aren't I special? No, he's wanting to speak to somebody besides just us. Now, yes, he blesses us as a result. You know, you can't be a blessing without getting blessed. So... It blessed me as well once I understood what it was all about, but it, it wasn't blessing me a whole bunch at the beginning. But I do remember telling her, I said, well, you know, here's what I see in this dream. There's this high street, and there's this house at the very end. And in this house, I see these two little girls playing on a couch. 
and you're lying in bed, and your husband is sitting in a chair, and he's speaking to you, but I can't hear what he's saying. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, and I'm not going to go through all of it. But see, God wanted her to know that God exists. Not that I interpret dreams. Not that I had some insight into her life. But God wanted her to know. He knew the intimacy and the deepest things in her heart. She lived on High Street. That was the name of the street she lived on in the last house on the street. I don't know this woman. I never met her. Sheila didn't tell me where she was from, who she was, anything, other than just she wanted me to talk to her. The street she lived on was High Street. She lived in the last house on the street. She had two daughters that were stillborn. That's who I saw playing on the couch. And her husband and her were having some real issues, and she said, I've just quit listening to him. He makes me sick. And a whole bunch of other stuff. But, but here she is lying in a bed sick is what I saw. Her husband's talking, but I don't know what he's saying. Can't hear him. Two little girls on the couch playing, just little girls, and the street she lived on and where the house was. And again, there was a lot of other things that I'm just not going to go into, but it was specific to her in a way that she knew I couldn't know this stuff. I don't even know if Sheila knew about the, the, the little girls that were stillborn, but it was, so it was a, it was a freak out. And she really knew God knew her heart and that God was trying to reach out to her and let her know I'm real. Trust me. Just trust me. And it was a great experience for me because it was God showing me how he wants to minister at times. And I'd had dreams before and I'd, other things when I first got saved. Sally and I had a, the exact same dream the same night. So God had spoken to me that way in the past, but it wasn't something that happens on a regular basis. But what I'm saying is this. God will do the same thing with you. He just wants to be able to minister to somebody. And he'll do it any way he can. Whatever works, that, that may be the only time it happens because it may be the only time it had to happen. But he can use anything and everything to reach out to people that otherwise could not be reached or would not be reached. And I don't care if they're Muslim, if they're, you know, Sikhs, uh, you know, Hindus, it doesn't matter. Catholics. Pentecostals. Praise the Lord. You know, they're, they're just people. And God has placed in all of us his reality. It just needs to be touched every once in a while. Somebody needs to just reach out and touch that reality and make it come alive in them. And that's what God will do. He wants to do, Sarah.
Right. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand for that. Praise God. Now, this is what I'm saying. You're, you're listening to this and you're thinking, my God, a stranger in my house? God didn't tell you to do it. Right? He didn't tell you to do it, so you don't have to have the grace to do it. That's my point. If we're listening to God, when God tells you to do it, you're okay with it. You're comfortable with it because you know God's involved in this. You don't want to just go out picking up strangers off the street, you could get yourself in some serious trouble. But if God tells you to do it, that person isn't going to be a stranger for long because God's wanting to show himself. This is exactly what Tammy was talking about. The only way his glory can be shown is through somebody. 
Same way, the only way the, the enemy's evil can be shown is through somebody, right? So we have to be sensitive to God. We have to be willing to listen to what God is saying and how God leads us and directs our steps because we're having opportunities for God to be revealed all the time. We just have to listen. We have to be sensitive and be aware of what's going on around us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. And that's, that's what we're talking about. Amen? Now, I want to just say a few things here before I get right into the message. But just in the context of what we've been talking about already this morning, the flesh is, is world consciousness or world conscious. It's, it's uh, in the sense realm. It operates strictly by our senses. Okay? Now, i got to tell you, in a situation like that, most of our senses would be repelled. I'm talking about the situation Sarah found herself in. Unless the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. Okay? So now that brings us to the Spirit. And the Spirit is God consciousness. It's being conscious of God and not just our surroundings or our, our senses. Amen? That's the Spirit realm. Okay? And then there is the soulish area, which is the self-consciousness. Just totally conscious of you and what you're doing and, and so on and so forth. That's the intellectual realm or the, in, the realm of the intellect. Reason and thinking through, you know, based on me, uh, on my situation, on what's good for me or isn't good for me or whatever. But the point is, what you focus on is your reality. So here, and this is a perfect example. Again, I don't want to, you know, uh, pick on Sarah here this morning. But look, she had a choice of three. She had three choices here. She could think about me, the soul, how this is going to affect me, uh, the, the self-conscious kind of realm, the intellectual realm, if you will. Or she could have used the flesh realm, which is sense conscious, which would say, this guy's dirty, he stinks, I don't know where he's from, he, what he's got, you know, where he's going and what he might be up to. And then there is the spirit realm. Now, you could have responded in either way. Either of those ways, you would have probably walked away and just maybe give him a dollar or two or, or, or you know, give him a drink or something and then just bolt. But because God was speaking to you, you were operating in the spirit realm. Even though you're still here in the natural, even though all these other senses are working and, and functioning, you're not paying attention to those. You're paying attention to the spirit realm. You're paying attention to the God realm. That's why when we talk about uh, the heavenlies or the kingdom of God, they're in the same place everything else is. You don't have to go a long ways to get to the kingdom of God. It's right here. It's right with us. It's just whether or not we're going to operate in that kingdom or in the kingdom of the world. That's a choice that we make all the time based on these three ways that we view the world and, 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 and the situations that we come in contact with. So what you believe is your reality. You know, we say uh, perception is reality. Well, it's true. I mean, what you really are believing is, is what is real to you, regardless of what, what might be real to somebody standing right next to you, seeing and experiencing the very same thing. Now, we talked about this a while back. Atonement is simply at one meant, being one with God. When you, you know, atonement is not just for us. It's, you know, he talks about us being reconciled that we may be reconcilers. So we can have the ministry of reconciliation. And so this guy probably, he may have heard about God. He may have got, uh, even gone to church when he was a kid or, or even recently. But it was, a, it was a religious experience. It was a sensual kind of thing. It wasn't a spiritual thing. Right. He had a spiritual encounter, which was just as real to him as it was to Sarah. But it was just because it was God moving in them and through them and causing them to operate in the spirit realm. So now, those of you that were here last week know I kind of got off into a, <laughs> I don't want to call it weird, but it's just weird based on the natural way that we think. I mean, it kind of stretches the way that we, we look at life, okay? And so I want to show you what I was talking about a, a, in, a, in a little bit different way. Because last Sunday I was talking about we, we walk like God, we can talk like God, we, we see like God, and we think like God. And the reason that is is so that we can reveal God. That's why we are born again, born of God. So we have this potential, but it's up to us, you know, if we're going to actually utilize it or not. So we have to look at Scripture, and I, I mentioned this Wednesday night, and it's not because I want to use a big word. It's just that 
you hear it all the time. Eschatologically speaking, we're t when, when people say that, we're talking about eschatology, we're talking about the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and eternity or, or uh, uh, immortality. That's all that word means. So when we look at things through that perspective or through that reality, everything starts to change. Now, you can know that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose the third day, and that now he is eternal. And because we believe in him, we are eternal. You can understand that intellectually, but you don't necessarily uh, operate that way. You don't necessarily live in that reality because if you move into that, you're actually operating in the Spirit. You're actually operating and living by the Spirit of God. So the reason I'm saying that is because this is getting beyond intellect or what you can see intellectually or what you can uh, sense in the natural or in the carnal or what you can reason out mentally. Because the more we try to do that, the further we actually go from the kingdom of God doesn't make you bad, it just means that the more you try to figure it out, the more reasons your intellect and your flesh will give you for not pursuing what it is God's trying to do. Right. It'll start building up excuses and, and logical, sense, make sense kind of reasons for not doing what God, the Spirit, is trying to lead you to do. So I'm talking, we're talking about getting past that gets you into the spirit realm. And that's when you begin to see the unseen. That's when you begin to experience the spiritual reality that is invisible to the natural man. You start hearing things with your real ears. You start seeing things with your real eyes, amen, that are not visible or audible to the natural person. Like I was talking about praying about how to deal with this girl. I, I heard a voice, but I didn't hear it with my ears. It was as clear as any voice I'd ever heard, but it was from the inside. I heard it, if I can say, by, in the spirit. It happens to all of us. We, you know, you, you, it's like a knowing. It's better than even an audible voice because it's, it's a, there's a sense of surety about it that goes beyond what I can reason out, okay? So the Word of God is spirit and it's truth. And it always speaks to who you really are, all of the Word of God. So I want to just talk about some things this morning to kind of change the way we look. We, we read scriptures, and we, we have a tendency to isolate them and, uh, you know, take them out of a, a larger context. The, the whole Bible is about the death, burial, resurrection, and eternal life. No matter where you go in it, that's what it's about. So I want to start, I want to read this morning from Ezekiel chapter 28 and uh, begin with verses 13 and 14. Ezekiel 28 verses 13 and 14. And, I, you know, when the Scripture talks about us being in Christ before the foundation of the world, that's eschatology. That's eternity. That's, that's we think rationally, you think, no, it's impossible because nobody was even born yet. How could I be in him if I wasn't born? Because you were a spirit. Amen. And God knows the end from the beginning. So this is the reality. But thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast waked, uh, walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse uh, 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 18.
Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Now, what I want you to really notice here is that he's talking about some things that are temple-oriented. In other words, he says, the sanctuaries. You know, he talks about, you have defiled the sanctuaries. And God, we know, walked there in the garden. He talked to Adam there. Here's my premise, and it's biblical, and I can show you all throughout the scripture, but the point that I'm making is Eden was the temple of God. The first temple. First place God came and met with man. It was the first temple. It's important because you're going to see God is playing this thing out all the way through the scripture. It isn't just like, you know, well, wow, it was the temple. There's a reason for it. There, there's, uh, there's the, well, I, I'll get myself sidetracked if I go too far the other direction. So look, it was the temple of God on earth. It was God's dwelling place. The mountain of God, he calls it, in one place. Another place, he calls it the holy mountain. All right? Now look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I'm hoping that through this, you're going to see yourself as God sees you and as you really are, who you really are. So that the things we talked about, the dream that I had, the experience... uh, Sarah had, and all of us have had similar kinds of, uh, you know, encounters, Tammy's uh, situations over and over where God is revealing himself, should be our normal routine. It ought to be the way we live our lives, the way we see life in the natural. Now, I'm not predicting or, or, or uh, defining what your experience will be or is, because it'll be unique to you and to the situation you find yourself in. So you can't just you know, you can't just kind of uh, be redundant about this and just say, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what Sarah did. You want to just be a let, let God. However God speaks to you, however he moves on you, that'll be the right way, and that'll be the thing that God's wanting to accomplish, whatever it might be. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became in, into four heads. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and it became, and, and it became into four heads. And, you, can, you know, the, it tells you the names of those rivers. The only one that we really probably would recognize today would be the Euphrates. But they're, they're all rivers that go out for what? To bring life, water giving life to the rest of the world, to the space beyond the temple. Okay, and that was God's desire to expand the temple so that it would fill the earth, so that his glory would fill the earth the way the waters cover the sea. That was God's original intent. And how many of you know God doesn't... I've got a book that says God always has a plan B, but that's not true. It just looks like it to us. God's plan is always plan A, and it never changes. He always keeps that plan. It just looks like to us in time and space that, well, he changed his mind, and now he's going to do this. No, he knew from the beginning what he was going to do, and it hasn't changed. It's always what he has in mind, amen? So we see here, there's a river of life that's flowing from God out of Eden, right? There's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there's also a tree of life, all right? Now, in the temple in the Old Testament, the Old, the old Covenant testament, or, or, or temple had a menorah. If you've ever seen a menorah, it represents the tree of life. It brings light. It brings revelation. It brings life, Okay? So that's what, that's what that is in the temple. That's what it represents. It was the tree of life. Okay, Ezekiel says he saw a river. Now, there is a river that flows out of the, out of the temple. Amen. It's, it's the life of God. It's God that is touching people, and then they carry that away because of the sacrifices and so on and so forth. So that was, it's, it's a metaphor, but it's, it's a reality, a spiritual reality. Ezekiel saw that spiritual reality or that metaphor in his vision when he said, and I saw a river coming from the throne, coming out of the temple, amen, flowing out of the temple, right? So that's, he's just saying what that was really representing, okay? And then in the ark, there was also 
the knowledge of good and evil, because in the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant, there was the Ten Commandments. There was the stones of law. What's good and what's bad. Okay? Now, God's purpose from creation was that his dwelling place would fill the entire earth and the heavens. So, Jesus became the temple. And he said, the water that I'll give you will spring up in you a well of water bringing everlasting life. And you'll never thirst again. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the tree of life because my leaves give healing. Praise the Lord. Eternal life comes from me. Amen. If you believe on me, you'll never die. It's like eating from the tree of life. Praise the Lord. So, Remember, the temple of God was God's dwelling place, and the purpose of it was to fill the earth. But here's the problem. The Jews stopped the flow. They dammed up, if you will, the, the, the water. They turned off the light, amen, and they hid the trees. Because the Father's house had stopped being a blessing to all nations, it prevented, literally prevented, other nations from coming to God. Because they they became so uh, insulated and single-minded about it just being about us, and nobody else gets in here, nobody else gets to experience God, amen, that they actually stopped what it was God intended the temple to be. All right, look at Mark chapter 11, and I want to read verses 13 all the way through 24, Sheila. Mark 11, 13 through 24. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. They come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and he began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. When he even was come, when even was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whatsoever Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you'll have them. Praise the Lord. So the temple had become like the fig tree. It had leaves, but it didn't have any fruit. It was, the temple was beautiful. It was probably the most beautiful building that there was, certainly in, in the Middle East, but probably anywhere in the, on earth at the time. Amen. But it, it was beautiful, but it didn't have any fruit to it. So speaking to the mountain is reference to the destruction of the temple, the temple mount. It had leaves, but it didn't have any fruit. It was failing to impart life. Praise the Lord. All right, drop down to verse 27, and we'll read verses 27 through 33. Now, stay with me, because this is about us. This is about our identity. This isn't just about a building somewhere. Everybody's freaked out about the the last day temple. I don't know if there's going to be one or not. All I know is it's irrelevant. There may be one, but it's not, that's not the issue. That's not what this is really all about. They come again to Jerusalem, and as he was talk, uh, walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and they said unto him, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee 
this authority to do these things. Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask of you one question and answer me. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men or of men? Answer me. They reasoned with, them, with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you then believe him? But if we shall say of men, then they were fear, afraid the people of the people, for all the men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, we can't tell you. And Jesus answered and said unto them, neither well, am I going to tell you then by what authority I'm doing these things. If you don't have the spiritual understanding to tell me why you responded the way you did to John the Baptist, then why would I share any other spiritual truth with you? All right? So this is what he's saying, that he exposed the ignorance and the failure of the temple leaders to understand what the temple was even for, what it was even about, why it was created in the first place, why God gave the design of this thing to Moses. All right, Matthew chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. This is Jesus speaking. If you had known what this means, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Jesus is telling them, I am the foundation. I am the chief cornerstone of a new temple. One that will fulfill the real purpose that God had intended clear back in the Garden of Eden. All right? Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 18. Now you say, well, the Jews were only doing what they were told to do. They never saw the spirit behind any of this. God wanted to see their heart. Jesus, he's of the same temple system. He's under the same covenant. And yet he's showing mercy where they wouldn't. Now you say, well, God told him in the law to don't do this and don't do that. And Jesus said, well, have, you know, look, the law is getting broken all the time. If the law is being broken for love, if the law is being broken for a higher uh, uh, good, then don't worry about the law, let's do the good. He said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm doing stuff that you're saying I, nobody should be doing. And I'm saying you don't understand what it is you are doing. And if you did, you would come on board with me. So he says, for whatsoever man he, he be that hath a blemish. This is, this is Leviticus. This is the law. He shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous. In other words, any external, anything that's damaged about a person had no right to approach the temple. Now you say, well, that's what God told him. God is trying to get to their heart. Amen? You, you say, well, no, he, he told him not to do, he told him, don't, don't do that for these people. God wants to expose himself. He wants somebody that will say, I know what the rule is, but come on, man. The rule is you don't pick up strangers. Yeah. Amen? The rule is you don't just tell somebody dreams that don't make any sense even to you. Yeah. Right? The rule is you don't make eye contact. The rule is you just read them a couple of scriptures, pat them on the head, and send them on down the road. When God's wanting the heart. Yeah. Because that's the only thing that person can really grasp okay so look at Matthew chapter 21 and verse 14 now we're still under the law we're under the same law as this still the old covenant Jesus hasn't died hasn't been buried hasn't been resurrected we're still under the old covenant and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them in the temple do you understand now why the Jews are freaking out? Because they have no spiritual discernment here whatsoever. They're seeing this as a rule book thing, way we operate, and that's it. And Jesus is trying to show them there's a greater truth than just keeping rules. 
It's the love of God that's trying to be exposed. It's the love of God. It's the grace of God that's trying to get out so that people can experience it. Okay? These, I'll show you. Isaiah talks about this. It's prophetic when Isaiah is speaking to of it. In other words, it's future. It, it isn't happening in Isaiah's day, but Isaiah is seeing it. He's seeing a, a, a picture of what God really wants this to be about. Okay? So Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 8. Now, it's easy to look at this abstractly, you know, or, or, or in the third person, so to speak, where it's not about me. It's just it's all about these other people. It's about you. This was written to you. It wasn't written to everybody. It was written to you. Now, everybody, you know, it was written to everybody, but that isn't the way you can look at it. You have to look at it like it was written to you personally. Praise the Lord. So neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from this people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. In other words, he's saying, These people that were, had physical issues, can't, he said, don't let them say, I can't be joined to the Lord. Don't let them say that I've been separated from God or from the people of God. Don't let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree or I can't produce anything for God. You know what a eunuch is. Amen. Remember the eunuch in the book of Acts? He comes to me, he said, hey, here's water. What hindereth me from being baptized? Under the old law, he wouldn't even open his mouth because he had no right to expect access to God. He was a eunuch. Okay, for thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in my, in my house, the temple, and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons of the, and of the daughters, better than the elite Jewish groups, okay? I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. When you think about people that got issues today, and they want to feel like they've been ostracized or they can't get in and get next to God. God's saying, you're the very one that I want. And I wanted you from the very beginning, but because of the interpretation and the way that we've looked at the scripture, you feel alienated and cut off from God. God's saying, that's the last thing I ever wanted. I'm just looking for a man. Amen? Who would stand up and say, send me. Let me, let me try this. Let me see if I can't do what it is you're really saying. Amen? It's also the sons of the stranger. Those are people that are not connected with Israel. That join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, even everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant. Again, entering into the covenant. Praise the Lord. Here's what he's saying. These outcasts are enjoying God's presence in his house. This is a prophetic picture, but that's what he's declaring. Everybody that you thought had no right to God, had no right to the blessings of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, are the very people that I'm calling to my house. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. I'm telling you, it ought to give you excitement for your children, for your loved ones, for anybody that struggles with the love of God. They may struggle with it, but God isn't struggling with his love for them. This is, the, this is the ancient history. This is the reality of who God is and what God is from the very beginning, from the very first manifestation of God uh, that we have record of in the Garden of Eden. This was his desire. It hasn't changed. He hasn't like come up with 30 different plans because the others didn't work. This is the plan. Always has been, always will be. Uh, John 2, 11. Oh, excuse me. 18, I'm sorry, Sheila. John 2, 18 through 22. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Again, they're on two separate pages. They're like in two different books. 
He's talking about the temple, the real temple, the purpose, the reality of what that temple is, and they're talking about a building that they've been messing in for years and using it for every purpose but the purpose that God intended it to be used for. So a new temple is coming. Amen? Amen? And so that's what he's talking about here. So how does the, the destruction and the rebuilding of the temple relate to the death and resurrection of Jesus? Well, this John 2 reference that we're looking at here as a temple, Jesus being the temple of God, yet that thing is actually developed in John chapter 1, verse 14. So let's look at that, John 1, 14. Jesus being the temple, it's being developed back in John 1, 14. For God so loved, you know, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, so on and so forth. And you jump to 1, 14, he said, we beheld his glory, right? And the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right? Now let me show you this. It's just like Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. Exodus 40, verse 34 and 35. See, they're not getting this. And these are the people that have the Torah, that have the Word of God, that have the temple, that have all the, the realities that God's trying to reveal Himself through, and they're missing it all. It isn't just that we don't think He's the Messiah. They miss every road sign, everything that was pointing to God, everything that God was trying to reveal to them because they were so focused on rules and on regulations that they missed the reality of who and what God really is. And we have the... We have the potential of doing the very same thing today. It's easy to look back at the Jews and say, what idiots, but when you start looking at things this way, you realize, hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that I missed, that I'm not connecting to who, what God is and what God wants to do that would make me more apt to be a representation of God than I have been. Because of my perception is my reality. So then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple or the tabernacle. Same thing. Amen? Praise the Lord. So the glory of God is tabernacling in Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's what John 1.14 is actually trying to expose is Exodus 40, 34, and 35. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know how long it had been since the glory had been in the temple? Probably since that experience with Moses. Because they lost the whole idea and the whole reality of what the temple was. God's dwelling place. God's want, desire to reach out and love the world through here, from here. A river that's going to flow out and bring life to everything that it touches. See, the presence of God, which had been in the Holy of Holies, has begun to burst forth into the world in the form of God incarnate in the form of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. John 1, verses 50, verse 51. John 1, verse 51. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou that thou seest greater things than these? Verse 51. And saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you will see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Right? All right, look at Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. Genesis 28 and verse 12. See, all these scriptures are there, but if we don't connect them with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they're just pretty little story off in Genesis somewhere. He dreamed, this is Jacob, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and the, behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. What did Jesus just say? 
You're going to see greater things than me telling you I saw you under a fig tree. If you hang around, sooner or later, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Verse uh, 17. And Jacob was afraid, and he said, how dreadful is this place, or how, this is weird. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He saw angels ascending and descending. What is Jesus saying over there? He's saying, you're going to see the real temple. Because you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the house of God. This was a concept that they had scripturally, but they never, ever grasped it. They were so totally content with their religion that they really didn't want what the religion was trying to point them to, the reality of God with them and God in them and God's love for them and God's mercy and God's grace. Jesus is the continuation of the true temple. Amen. Not a building. Not a structure that can be manipulated and hassled with and controlled by people, but the continuation of the original temple, the garden. Amen? The light of the world. Healing. Eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Well, that's worth shouting about. Praise the Lord. That's something about Jesus. Amen? Praise God. Getting some revelation what religion does and what revelation can bring. But look at this. 16, please. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? How many of you have heard that before? Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. Don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter 2 and 5. We're finding out what this born again thing is really supposed to be about. It isn't about developing a religion or, 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 or you know, extending some religious views. It's about our identity. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Stones. We're building something. Amen? A spiritual house is what we're building, and we are stones. All right? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22. in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Praise the Lord. People have sold millions of dollars worth of books about the end time temple. Red heifers. You know, I mean, all this stuff. And we have it right before our eyes every single day. Is a red heifer However pure that is, are those ashes more pure than the blood of Jesus? Could any, whatever sacrifice they might come up with, going to be greater than the sacrifice Jesus has already made? Now I ask you, why are we so focused on a physical temple? They may be focused on it because they have no revelation, but the truth is we shouldn't be worried about it one way or another because it isn't the end. We are the temple of God. We are the end time temple of God. Yeah. And it's clear throughout the Bible that that's what he... And I'm not picking on Jews. I, I support the nation of Israel, the state of Israel, amen, and the Jewish people because that's where our roots all come from. But I'm not jumping on the bandwagon that God turned his back on, amen, so that they would, by jealousy, turn back to God. Jealousy of what? Of how much God loves the Gentiles whom they hated and despised and didn't want to have anything to do with, and whom ye also are building together for a habitation of God through the temple, or through the Spirit, praise the Lord, the presence of God, a habitation in a temple. Yes. Praise God. God's temple, God's presence, God's kingdom is supposed to grow 
and fill the earth. Right? All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. And we, we, we thought we were growing the, 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 the kingdom and, and the temple of God, or if we understood that reality or not, by handing out tracts that would get people to accept our particular denominational doctrine. Instead of sharing the love of God, instead of showing the reality of who God is, we were, we've been doing the same thing the Jews did. Come my way or get the hell out of here. Because it's my way or the highway. This is the only way. You're not getting, you know, and missing the whole point of what God is trying to do. Show himself for who he really is. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Praise the Lord. We have to speak the word of God in order to grow the body of Christ, which is the temple of God. Our growth, our maturing, becoming full grown in Christ is only possible one way. by the feeding of the word, by the renewing of our minds, yeah. by constant exposure to the word of God. Yeah. And that happens through one another. Yeah. You say, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have scripture memorized. You don't have to have scripture memorized. We've heard the word of God already here. You know, the word of God is not King James Version. The Word of God is a principle, it's a reality, it's a, it's a root truth that God has placed in all of us. Remember, he said, I'm, I, I, no longer will you have to be taught one from another, but I'm going to put my Word in you. How does he do that? Does he just download the entire Bible into our you know, computer system and now we've got it all? No, he puts his principles, his reality, his truth in you so that when you respond to people, if you'll operate by the Spirit, you'll respond in agreement with the Word of God. You may not have the Scripture to quote, but you'll say what the Scripture intends to happen. Amen. Praise God. I'm not again, listen, I'm not saying don't study the Bible, don't memorize scripture. I'm just saying that is not, look, we've got, the Jews knew the scripture better than anybody did, and they missed the whole thing even though they had it all memorized. Because they didn't have the heart of what it meant. They didn't have the principles behind it. They just took the letter, and Jesus said it's the spirit that gives life, not the letter. The letter kills, and the spirit gives life. So you can quote the letter all day long, and all you're doing is killing people. And one word of the Spirit will bring life. Praise the Lord. So it happens through one another, through each of us. And this growth in Christ, the growth and the building up of the temple of God is what God's really about, what he's interested in. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. And Sheila... I don't know how hard it is to jump from chapter to chapter, but I'd like to go uh, 1 Peter 1.23 right through 1 Peter 2 and 9. So we're staying in, in, in uh, sequence, but you have to go through a chapter. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And let me stop for just a moment. We're kings and priests. Now, I'm gonna, I get a little bit ahead of myself here, but what did they do? Whenever Jesus, even when Jesus was healing people, what did he do? Just go show yourself to the priest. Because what they say is what's going to happen. That's, that's what's going to give you access. You understand what I'm saying? We declare who's healed and who's not healed. Not the devil, not the doctor. You're healed in Jesus' name, and by God, you are. Yeah. Amen. We, we think, oh, we're kings and priests. Come on, there's a reality to this. It isn't just some 
pretty little thing to say and make you feel good like you're special. No, you have a function. You have a calling. You have a purpose. And it's your identity. It's who God declares you to be. Okay, so you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise the Lord. We are kings and priests. And this spiritual house is the temple where we serve. Not this house, this house. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise because the Lord. what we heard this morning, and again, I'll just use Sarah for the example. Sarah was ministering in the temple. That's right. Yes. Praise the Lord. Holy nation, peculiar people, show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We'll go back and, and, and to verse 23. Let me read through this again. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who is own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you are as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, but the flower and the flower thereof falleth away. Talking about flesh, humanity. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is good. We were talking about growing up and maturing in Christ. To whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Chief cornerstone of this temple we're talking about. You, as lively stones, are built up on that foundation, on that chief cornerstone, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Come home with me. Let me buy you a dinner. Let me show you that God loves you. Amen. Let me say something to you that God would say to you instead of what the church says, instead of what Sister you know, twisted pants has to say to you, but somebody who really wants to represent the love of God, the reality of who God is. Yes. Amen. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Praise the Lord. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. This is, this is religion, church. This is exactly what happened to Israel. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. They were appointed to the word, and they stumble over it because they're not doing it. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you would show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We serve in this temple. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and now I want to read verses 10 through 23. I know it's a lot of scripture, but this is important. Because this is the reality of what it is we're supposed to be living. And praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 10, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 10. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 23. See, what, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, and you have fulfilled the entire law. How do you, gonna, how do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You don't. You won't. You want to, but you won't. So he gives us an avenue to love God, which is the guy sitting in the grass. 
the girl who comes because she is, doesn't think God even exists or cares. If he does, he doesn't care about her. Yeah. Or a house burns down, and you stand there and sing praises to the Lord in the shower for the nurses who are all wanting, all they want to do is have a pity party. And Tammy won't let him because her God's too big. I'm not saying we wouldn't be sad. I'm not saying we wouldn't grieve over the loss. But we don't grieve the way the world does. We've got hope. We've got something more than they've got. And it's about time we started sharing it, amen, in some tangible way. Instead of keeping a rule and thinking, well, I did my thing, so I'm good with God. And miss the whole point of why the rule was given in the first place. The, the law stirs up sin. It says it does. Praise God. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, this is Paul, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. We think we're talking about winning some person to God. I preach, you know, I sowed the seed, and then somebody else comes and waters it. He's talking about a building here. He's talking about a spiritual building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. I've given you Jesus. I've shared Jesus. I've given you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I'm making him real to you. And then another one comes along and builds on that. Praise the Lord. But let every man take heed how he builds on it. Because you can have the foundation and a ramshackle house that will cave in on you the first windstorm, even if the foundation is good, if everything else was slipshod. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work will be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. A lot of people are building, but they're not building gold, silver, right? Right? They're building with hay and straw. They're building with man's labor. Not, how many of you know God creates the diamonds and the rubies? and the, Man doesn't make those. You can, you can get the, you know, the paste, but that's not the real thing. The real thing God creates. Amen? If any man defile the temple of God, so know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Praise God. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Praise God. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. And we turn on a Christian show, and we see somebody ministering, and we go, oh, I wish I could get to that church. I wish I could get to that service. Oh, if I'd only been in Brownsville. Oh, if I'd only been in Toronto. Oh, if there would just be another Brownsville, or if there would just be another Toronto. That's what he's talking about. We're so you know, quick to elevate some person or some thing or some place. When you are the temple of God and a priest of God, if it ever comes to where the church really starts doing what the church was intended to do, that will be the last televised revival. Because there will be revival everywhere all the time, and it will become redundant to even turn on a TV to watch it. Because there'll be more miracles in your, at the local Walmart than there can be on any given television show for two or three hours. 
But see, because we have this mindset that we got to go get this and we're going to have this thing happen, we're missing the reality of what God has already placed in us. I'm not against revival. I'm just against the, the elevating of a particular thing or some place above the presence of God. I mean, I've seen enough of those. I've, I've, I've watched them, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not doubting the sincerity. I just get tired of it. So who cares who you are? Who's coming to your church to preach? Who's going to be there to do this? Or who's going to be, or who's going to be at so-and-so's? And we all got to get down there and watch this. You get down and watch it, you'll get two hours of uh, a back rub and go home and be just as dysfunctional as far as the, the, the temple is concerned as you were before you went. And you'll have to have another one of these things. You'll have to go somewhere else and get another one. If those things were the answer, by God, by, by now, wouldn't we have had a worldwide revival? Wouldn't Jesus have returned? Yes. No, because it's always about men. No matter how we try to soft soap it and sell it as something else, it always ends up the same thing. If I can just get Sister Hassenfloss, you know, to pray for me, or Brother, you know, whatever. Lay hands on me. Oh, it'll all be good. I'm the high priest. I'm the one. You're the high priest. I decide who's healed. I determine who's healed, not brother so-and-so, not somebody else's ministry, you know, 105, 200 miles away or whatever. I'm the high priest. I minister healing, and I declare healing. Every one of us are. But as long as we're willing to believe our flesh and our, our, our own minds, we're always giving evil reports. Oh, man, I got this thing and I got that thing. And, well, oh, this ain't good because I just saw somebody else had it and died. Runs in my family. Well, let it run right out of your family. Amen. Run it off. Amen. With the word of God. And you live by the power of God and declare yourself healed, which is your authority and your right as a high priest or a priest in the temple of God. Yes. Jesus is our high priest, but we are all priests in the temple. And this is your temple. Hallelujah. So we grow by the word of God and are believing it over the natural realm. You say, well, I, I, you know, I go to church. That's as natural as anything. Church, just because it's a church doesn't make it spiritual. You know that. You can sit here and be as carnal as you want in church. So can I. You can think every kind of carnal thought under the sun. That's why I'm praying in tongues all the time. I'm not thinking the best stuff all the time. But I'm declaring what God's saying in spite of what I might be thinking. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. We build gold, silver, precious stones. That was how he described Solomon's temple. But he tells us that's how we're supposed to build, right? Look at Isaiah 54, verse 11 through 17. Isaiah 54, God gave me 35 years ago now. And I'm still trying to, I'm still figuring it out little by little what God was trying to say to me in that little East Texas house in the country. Praying and God speaking to me, Isaiah 54. And I didn't know Isaiah from Joe Blow, let alone Isaiah 54. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors. And lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression for thou shalt not fear and from terror for it shall not come near thee. The song Sarah was singing this evening or this morning. It touches me every time I hear it. Because it resonates with that, with the reality of who God says that we are. Yes. And all your children will be taught of the Lord. How can they not be? They're right there in the temple. Access to God every day, every moment of the day, all the time. It may not look like it. They may not always act like it. But we've got a guarantee that they will be taught of the Lord. Amen. And they have peace for them. Their peace shall be great. The shalom of God, the peace of God, which passes understanding, belongs to our children. And I'm the priest, and I'm declaring it in Jesus' name. Praise God. I don't care how goofy they act. They're going to be taught 
and they're going to have the peace of God that passes understanding. A lot of times it's us that need the peace that passes understanding because they don't even care. They're not worried about it. But in righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. And from terror, it shall not come near thee. I don't care if they busload the Muslims in here or fly them in by jumbo jets. I'm believing it, the more that come, the more that are going to get turned around, the more that are going to be saved, the more that are going to be transformed. If they want to start some crap, God is bigger than all of them. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm not laying awake at night worrying about somebody in a burqa or anything else. Doesn't mean I don't think or I don't have feelings, but I'm just not going to let that dominate me. I'm not going to let that free. Hey, Israel was outnumbered all the time, still is to this day, and God's still on their side. God's still going to protect them. God's still going to provide for them. I am the temple of God. He's through destroying temples. He did it once so the greater temple could come, and I, I look at it in the mirror every day, at least the exterior of it. In righteousness I'm established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Praise God. Behold, they shall surely gather together. Oh, yeah, they will. They have been. They will continue. But not by me. Crap comes, but it ain't coming from God. Whosoever shall gather together against you will fall for my sake. Whatever the enemy wants to bring up, he'll just get slapped. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon. Listen, he created the devil. So don't think that the devil has anything on God. God's already told us, clear back in, Gen or clear back in Ezekiel. He said, you know what's going to happen to him? I, I've got a fire in him that's going to consume him. He's going to be burnt up from the inside out. And everybody that looks on him is going to say, is that the guy we've been freaked out about for the last five, six, seven thousand years, whatever it's been? Is he the one? God created him, just like the old joke about parents. I brought you into this world, I can take you out. That originated with God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Every tongue that rises against me, every, every, every thought of uh, premature death or sickness or disease or poverty or lack, or all, all, every time you hear it, every time that tongue rises up, I've got, you've got the authority to condemn it, to shut it down, amen, and tell it to shut its mouth and take that lie somewhere else where they want to listen to it. Amen. Praise God. We don't build with or by the words of human wisdom. He's already told us that's a waste of time because they're fools. But by God's word, as it's fulfilled in Christ, it is finished. Praise God. Only God's word in Christ can grow believers and keep believers in and through all the fiery trials and the tribulations that are in this world. We are overcomers by the word of our testimony, hallelujah, the word of God and the blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And out of our innermost river, or out of the, our innermost being, flows the river of life. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. They receive the leaves of healing. Hallelujah. We speak the word of God and it brings light. Revelation comes. Praise God. And the knowledge of good and evil was eaten up by Jesus. Yes. Yep. So we know nothing but good. Right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Good and evil still in the land, but not in the temple. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are the righteousness of God in yes. Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. We, the scripture even tells us that we should have no consciousness of sin. Shouldn't even think about it. Shouldn't even be something that comes into your mind. I'm not talking about doing it. I'm talking about thinking. Because we all fail. 
in the natural. But we don't have to be conscious of that. We don't have to let that dominate our thinking. We are to think the thoughts of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We are to live out that reality. And if you'll just meditate on this stuff, you'll see God begin. Actually, he won't begin to open doors. You'll just begin to see the doors that are open. Because they've been open. He's been opening. He's been saying stuff, but all of a sudden you'll have ears to hear. Amen. But just let it be God. You don't have to get ahead of him. You don't have to do something because somebody else did it. You just do what God gives you to do. And that will be a victory. That will be a tremendous blessing for somebody. It may, be a, it may, it may actually seem like a small thing to you. But that may be the very thing that brings God alive to that person, that makes God real. Yes. Hallelujah. And what happens? Just what Tammy said. The glory fills the temple. And it begins to pass through the walls to where you can't even minister. To where God, glory is so great, people just go, he really is. He really is. And his glory will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. He said, you know, in the last days, gross darkness, great darkness will be in the world. But the light of God will shine brighter than it ever has before. We don't have to be afraid of the darkness. Darkness always flees the light. Praise the Lord. It always runs from the light. We just need to be the light. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. Amen. Thank you for being patient. I went along, but uh, praise the Lord. If I'd have said everything I could have said about it, we well, you know, if they wrote all the books that could be written, our eyes would wear out long before we got through them all. So God bless you. Yes, Ron. There you go. That's exactly right. You know, I, I talked about the, let me, let me just back up for just a second. If the tree of life is in us, let me, let me read one more scripture, okay? I've already made you late, so wherever you were going. Let's go to Mark 11, if you will, again, Sheila. Mark 11, verses 22 through 24. Mark 11, okay, that's all right, I can read it. Just leave it down, that's all right. Mark 11, we already read from here before, but I just want to go back to touch on one thing. Mark 11, verse uh, 22. These glasses are about worn out, so don't. Mark 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and be not and have not and shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, because of that, I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now here's the thing praying to move a mountain. We, we, we've made it about a lot of things, but here's the reality, based on the context that we know he's actually talking about. Praying to move a mountain is a prayer for transformation. Transformation into a new church, into a new temple. You understand what I'm saying? He's saying that temple is not functioning the way God created it to function. And he said it's like the fig tree. It's got leaves, but there's no fruit there. It looks good, but there's nothing, the being, no life giving it coming from it. So when we are talking about, well, I'm going to pray, pray and move that mountain. What you're really, what he's telling you to pray is transform that temple here. Yeah. Reveal the true temple in me. Not in a building. Right. Praise the Lord. See, Jesus cursing at fig tree isn't just judgment, but it's hope. Mountains will move when we grow up into the mature Christ and stop playing these games thinking we're being spiritual. It's the word of God, amen, that builds up the church. 
not some meeting somewhere. I'm not saying they're not, they're, they don't have purpose. I'm just saying if we would just do what he called us to do. Yeah. Revival fires would, sp- I mean, it's just in us to do this. This is who we are. I mean, I've been watching uh, Billy Burke. Look, I got nothing against the guy, and, and I, I know there's miracles. I mean, there are people being healed. But somebody, please show me that in the Bible. Show me Jesus doing any of that. Is he measuring how well, how much did you get healed? Well, how's your pain now? Is it a five? Is it a six? The only time there's anything like that at all is when the guy, he prays for the guy's sight, and he says, he says I see men as trees. So I don't know, he did something like spit in his face, and now he saw it pretty good. Yeah. It only takes somebody spitting on me once to say, I see everything fine, don't spit anymore, okay? Yeah. Everything's good. I'm not, pick, I'm not picking on people, I'm just saying what we've already talked about here. Uh-huh. You are the high priest or not the high priest, but you are the priest in the temple. You declare. They sent the people, amen, with their, if it was uh, uh, leprosy, which is a type of sin. It's it's a type for sin under the new covenant. These guys were lepers. Jesus healed them. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest because he's the one that has the authority to declare you healed. And we're running around trying to get somebody else to pray for me when I'm the one or you're the one that has the authority to just say, hey, go. I, by his stripes, I'm healed. I don't need somebody else's opinion about this. Amen. I'm the last opinion. Amen. I declare by his stripes, I was healed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Speak to the mountain. Speak to your religious crap that gets so, you know, ingrained in us that we don't even know it's there anymore. And we think, whoa, this is, we're really operating in the spirit. Well, I'm sure they thought it, but we know better because when you look at the scripture, you find out they had not, they did not have a clue what any of this was about. You, you actually, by this one message, and this isn't about me, I'm just saying, you have more revelation than the high priest of Israel had at the height of of his power and authority. And they had all of the word of God that was available to man at the time. So don't tell me we can just figure it out. You've got to have the spirit of God to lead you yes. and to guide you. And you can't presuppose things and think that it's going to happen just because you supposed it would. Mountains will move, and they'll move when we grow up into the temple that replaces that religious facade that Jesus was dealing with. We grow into the temple that we really are, expanding to fill the entire earth with the glory of God. I can tell you right now, the glory of God in you is so great, if you would concentrate on it, it would stop you from doing anything. It would put you in your seat. The glory of God filled the temple, and they were unable to minister. You can get so full of God that it'll just shut you up and set you down because you just don't know what to do with it all. Praise the Lord. When that happens, everybody sees it. Everybody gets ministered to. Praise the Lord. All right. Last time. I won't, I won't start again. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. Go out there and temple up. Praise the Lord.